Good evening and thank you for joining us on Straight Talk. Last week, we began our discussion on the education system here in Hong Kong. We had a DSE graduate from a non-Chinese speaking background and the other graduate was a recent immigrant from the mainland. We talked about whether Hong Kong's education system is fit for purpose and how well it caters for all our students from all different backgrounds and abilities. This evening, we asked the question, can Hong Kong's education system produce excellent world-class students? And we have two more recent graduates who will also share their experiences and insights. Let's welcome our guest. On the left is Ms. I.C. Koo, and on the right is Mr. Terry Lam. So welcome to the show. Um, let's start by introducing yourself, and let's start with Terry. Uh, so, hi everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be on this television show. Um, so I'm a graduate from St. Paul's Co-Educational College, and I just took the DSE this year. Yeah. Right, I see. Hi everyone, and it's also my honor to be here for the show. And I'm also a graduate from St. Paul's Co-Educational College and also a DSE student this year. Right, the reason why we invite both of you here tonight is not because I'm an alumni of St. Paul's Co-Educational College, it's because both of you did very well in the DSE exams. You are both champions or so-called perfect scorer. So Terry, did you expect this good results? Um, definitely not, because well, um, in evaluating my personal academic abilities, I do find myself having some kind of shortcomings in certain subjects, and uh, and definitely there's also a huge luck factor when it comes to um, tackling the DSE. So I was rather surprised when I um, received the news that I, I did quite well, well, much greater than my expectations. Yeah. Right, I see. Um, I'm also very surprised with the exam because uh, there are a lot of uncertainties in DSE exams and we won't know the marking schemes before the result is out. So that's why I don't know at how good I actually perform. And also because there are a very, very small numbers of top scores this year. So the quota is very limited for us. That's why I'm also very surprised when I actually get the top score. Right. Um, I know both of you had a lot of um, interviews that we uh, either newspapers or the radios, and I'm sure television, this, and uh, especially on English Channel, this is your first time. And I've seen that um, at, our, uh, at the, ph the photographs that the actual school principal and the president of the council actually took the photograph video, which was a, quite a, a, I think the first time in many years. So I'm sure the school is very excited. So there must be something that you have done well so that you get, get such scores. So Terry, can you share with the viewers, although you've been very humble, you said that it's luck has a big part to play in it, but I'm sure there are some goodness in your study. So how did you prepare for the exams? I guess another part that um, you know plays a huge role is your mentality when you're going to DSE exams and of course when you um, before you start the DSE exam it's important for you to get adjusted to how exams work and also another kind of idea is to manage your stress um, because in Hong Kong you might have a lot of expectations from you know your teachers or your families and therefore you have to find a lot of good ways for you to relieve yourself relieve your stress um, or, a bit, a bit moderately, as you don't want to, you know, um, overly, you know, get engrossed in other kinds of activities. For me, I find myself being able to, um, let's say, play some, let's say, video games um, every day, you know, before the DSE exam, which is a good way for myself to maintain perhaps um, a good mindset, so that you yourself you are not too stressed when you go into the exam hall. Right. I see. Do you feel the stress as well? Um, I understand the stress, but personally, I don't feel that much stressful for me because I guess I have my own method, which is to learn and re revise with my friends. So by asking questions or sharing notes and exercises with my friends, we are actually having more like interpersonal interactions. So that are helping me to escape from the pressures that it's given by the exams and the like revisions. And I guess also by asking friends questions or teaching them sometimes, it's actually helping us to revise on our own and to make sure we can remember everything and so I guess it's a good way for us to revise and also at the same time relieving our stress by having more interactions with people. Right, Harry, I'm sure that your parents love you a lot and supported you a lot. So how much contribution do you think the parents has in this success? 
Well, definitely quite a lot because, you know, right before the DSC, they, they didn't really give me a lot of, you know, pressure, especially they did not expect me to score very high, no, not in a negative way, but it's kind of like encouragement that whatever I, I score, they'll be very satisfied with it. And they also had a lot of chances to take me out um, to dine together or perhaps, you know, cook breakfast for me every morning. So it's a very uh, simple yet uh, very profound way of showing support to your child, right. you know, right before. I see you, I mean, your father is here with you today and your sister. I'm sure they supported you a lot. So how much would you attribute your success to their support? Um, I guess it's probably half of that because um, they're providing me with a lot of mental support, especially because our study journey are like actually filled with COVID-19 pandemic. So we don't have actually a lot of uh, interactions with the other's friends or like teachers, but most of the time we spend with families. So that's why I believe that their mental supports or their words of encouragement or just comfort are actually giving me a lot of like powers to carry on my journey on our own uh, for the DSE exams. So that's why I believe that my good mentality regarding the exams, it's actually con contributed a lot by them. I see. How about, how about your school, St. Paul's Square? How much has it contributed to your success, do you think? Um, I'm not sure about the percentage, but then they're also contributed a lot academic wise, especially because they have a very a lot of good teachers and teaching you a lot of skills and the, like skill sets you need, the knowledge you need for the exams and prepare you well for how you can perform in the exams well. All right, Terry, would it be different if you went to another school? Well, definitely a bit different, though, um, because I really owe a lot to the kind of teachers we have at our school. For instance, uh, you know, right before the DSE, I was extremely worried about my Chinese results, but um, my Chinese teacher was very generous to help me, you know, grade my compositions. So, so to give gave me a lot of advice, so that I was being pointed in the right direction when it comes to the DSE. And without their help, I wouldn't be able to um, end up with such good results. Yeah. Right. Um, I know both of you, since you have always been doing well at school, you have always had the privilege to be exposed to the Hong Kong systems of gifted education, which I happen to be the, the chairman of the advisory committee on gifted education. And we have um, the academy, that, that Academy of Gifted Edu for Education that you, we went to. So how much has that academy actually helped you, do you think? Because in Hong Kong, we have three levels of support. Level one and level two are school-based. Level three are the external uh, institution like the, the Gift Education Academy. You both, uh, both of you were there. So Terry, can you tell us what exactly or how it actually helped you? Well, um my experience in joining in the you know Hong Kong Academy for Gifted Education, abbreviated you know HKAGE, um, I guess I joined it when I was in primary school, and since then I've been joining courses um, through um, the platforms in HKAGE. For instance, uh, when I was in primary school, um, I joined a course in like statistics or so. Um, but I guess the content was way beyond the kind of levels you would see in primary schools. And it was really a chance for me to experience what it would be like to step out of the classroom and explore you know, different kinds of ideas outside of the usual curriculum. And therefore, I guess it's a good way for me to realize that there's much more beyond what you learn at school. And in secondary school, I guess more of what I use the resources in HAG is for joining different kinds of competitions, for instance, in physics or beyond. And I guess these courses have really um, taught me how to, you know, do more kind of self-directed learning um, so that you actually attain the kind of mindset of lifelong learning as, you know, the saying goes, um, wisdom is kind of like not a product of mere teaching, but also as a result of a lifelong attempt to acquire it. Yeah. Right. So both of you have attempted like local national or even international competitions. And Terry, you are a gold medalist in the International Physics Olympiad. And I see you had the Star Bright Scholarship six years ago, and recently you presented in front of the Chief Secretary of Administration on your good work. So how do you see all these competitions? I mean, would it give you extra pressure or how does it help you, I see? Um, I think the key point for it is actually for improvement because in the different kinds of competitions and events, we are actually having the experience to improve ourselves through trials and errors. You're actually utilizing your skills and knowledge you have learned at schools or outside in actual scenarios. So ne you need to focus more on probably like critical thinking for debates and also some presentation skills in public speaking. So you're actually using the skills you have learned in these kind of scenarios and you need to compete with the others, which is also a good opportunity for us to exchange 
exchange our knowledge with the others by having like look at the others exp uh, others performance or others competitions so we can learn from them as well right terry before the break i want to ask you a question since you are um I'm, I'm a very good student in physics do you ever have challenge? I mean, feel difficulty when you learn the physics, or you always it's so natural that you are a champion in that? Oh, of course not. Um, you know, you, there's indeed a lot of concepts you cannot get, um, you cannot understand on the first try, and therefore it's a good idea to consult your peers or even your teachers to um, exchange your ideas so that you can actually gain a more comprehensive view. Yeah. Right. Let's take a break now, and viewers, do stay with us. We will be right back. Thank you for staying with us. We have been exploring the question, can Hong Kong's education system produce excellent world-class students? We have Terry Lam and Isaac Koo, two DSE champions with us this evening. So in the first half, um, Terry has said to us that by playing with video games, it really relaxes you, and then so that you can get off pressure. And with IC, you use the method of joining, study with your friends and talk about it. So everyone has different ways of relaxation. Um, let's. Before I'm going to ask you about your plans, I'm sure the viewers would like to know what our champions will do. I want to ask your viewers about the education system. I see, as I said in last week, I said a lot of people feel that Hong Kong students are being very pressurized, they're pushing for results. It's like a, um, a pressure cooker, as you mentioned earlier. Do you agree? Um, I do think it's a problem, it's like pressure cooker, because the uh, Hong Kong education system is more like exam oriented. So everyone is working towards a very good grades or the numbers of stars in DSE, DSE's exams or IB exams. So that's why I believe that it may be a problem for students not to going outside the curriculums to learn more about the subjects or to explore more on their own interests. Instead, they will put more effort on like achieving good scores in exams. So that's why I believe that Hong Kong education system indeed have a lot of good professional teachers and professional trainings, but it may be also problems uh, having like more exam-oriented and it's limiting the students' potentials in exploring a bigger world outside. But well, how will you suggest to improve that? Um, I believe that we should encourage students to utilize their skills learned in the classroom settings and use it in the outside world, for example, like going to field trips and looking into the world and having more interactive classes, uh, for example, by having debates, by learning language, for example, through debates or through drama or through different ways instead of only doing papers and exercises. Right, Terry, I see has said that um, more field trips will be sort of more practical application. You being a physics person, uh, so I have said because you have the, your, your prices. So how do you think the, the, the physics you have learned can actually be applied um, to daily lives? Well, I guess there's quite a lot, really. For instance, um, looking around you, all of the kind of lighting equipment around you has already quite a lot of, you know, underlying principles. Or there's even quite a lot of things that you can already deduce from looking around yourself, and you you can actually know a lot about the kind of physics you use, and even a lot of, you know, daily principles such as, you know, when you look at the weather, there's also quite a lot of, you know, different kinds of scientific principles behind, and therefore, um, I guess study studying physics or certain kinds of subjects like these uh, develop a kind of simple scientific literacy for, you know, let's say um, learning about, you know, deducing some kind of what you do, let's say your habits or even let's say to, um, you know, as a way of deducing whether facts you see online are true mm -hmm. or not, yeah, etc. Right, thank you, Terry. And, and I see, uh, let's move on to your plans. Um, I've been reading reports of your interviews and you said you want to be a medical doctor. What makes you want to pursue that profession? Um, firstly, because I've taken courses regarding biomedical sciences before, and I was I find it really appealing to me. So I guess academic-wise, it will be a good path for me. And then secondly, it's because the sense of achievement that I can get by curing and saving people, because I believe that saving the patient's life is not only saving themselves, but also by saving their families and everyone who will be happy in the family. And also my goal is to give the dignities for the patient to live, not only their life, but also dignity to live and live a good life, living qualities. And how do you plan to pursue that? Just study medicine in Hong Kong and then pursue maybe a, um, a specialist uh, field? What, what, any plans at this stage? 
Um, yeah, I guess I'm also going to stay, like, stay in Hong Kong for medical degrees first. And I hope to explore more in the overseas university, probably for my master degrees or for the specialist, uh, specialty training. So I guess that may be like in the future. Right. You mentioned in a newspaper interview that you want to stay in Hong Kong to do what Hong Kong really needs. So what do you mean by what Hong Kong really needs? Um, so firstly, for the medical field, like the healthcare, uh, healthcare system, it's actually having a few problems, for example, like the imbalance between the public and the private sectors or the like shortage of labors in the healthcare system. So I hope that through my own contribution, I can become a practitioner in the medical field and also hope to pro probably, if possible, we can have some policies or some changes in the settings of the medical systems, for example, like balancing the public and private services. So by having these kind of services and changes so we can change the medical field in the future. Right, Terry, your plans? Well, personally, I hope to study, you know, science-based subjects in university and beyond, and hopefully in the future I could become, let's say, a scientist or something of like an educator or something. Yeah, these are all possible career plans. Yeah. Right, I also read the news you're planning to go to England, UK, mm -hmm. maybe in Cambridge. Yeah. Has it, has, have they accepted you? Yeah, so I guess because my DSC results are satisfactory and, um, you know, meet their standards. Right. Have you ever considered going to Beijing to study instead? <laughs> that, that's definitely an interesting um, idea and perhaps I may have considered it in the past, but I guess um, there's also other chances you can explore and, you know, it's only like what I'm planning right now, it's only undergraduate and of course there's a lot of other places you can go after that and there's definitely a lot of places you can consider as well. Well certainly I, I'm not teasing you, I'm, I'm just saying that because a lot of Hong Kong students do go abroad and do very well when they come back. So as you may have watched our show last week, um, we want to ask you a direct question from one of the graduate from gifted education academies before, who's a medical doctor now, Dr. Chang. And she wanted us to find out if uh, uh, so-called the youth now see that you have a, a social ladder. Is a, is a social ladder actually being broken? Because a lot of people saying that if you're not well off, it's very hard to break the glass barrier. So I see, what do you think? Um, I think like indeed there are some problems regarding the social letters. For example, there may be problems like intergenerational poverty and the students and the like more the unfortunate children, they may not be, it may not be easy for them to get out of the poverty cycle because their families are not uh, wealthy enough in order for them to get a good education in the future. Or probably they are even having problems with their basic livings. So I guess they will need to work harder and pay more effort in uh, sustaining their own life. So that's why they may not have as much ex uh, like exposures or as many opportunities as the more wealthy classes in, uh, re in pursuing their own dreams or career in the future. But I guess the society is also working to repair the social letters by providing more free opportunities for these children. But then I guess another problem is regarding the sandwich class, which may not be uh, like exposed to the lower like welfare, but then they cannot reach the higher standard uh, educations or career pr letters. So that's why I guess it's still a problem in Hong Kong. Right. Terry, do you think that there's a glass ceiling? Well, perhaps like in the so issue about the social ladder, you indeed see a lot of ways that, um, you know, the social ladder is broken in particular, for instance, in some schools like, like SPCC itself, you know, it, perhaps some people may think that, um, you know, SPCC does not um, accept a lot of students from lower backgrounds, or perhaps it's a school food, food of people in the upper class. And this could be a way because in, in SPCC, perhaps um, um, the uh, the kind of fees that you have to pay are quite high and not a lot of students uh, can afford that. Even with um, the kind of scholarships that SPCC provides, it's not that not a lot or other kinds of free remission or any aspects of, let's say, getting into, you know, other kinds of um, academic institutions. Sometimes you would also need a lot of, you know, extracurricular activities. So I guess in this aspect, um, there are a lot of kinds of accessible activities, even for those who might not have enough um, financial capital, for instance, um, say the competition like in physics competitions in Hong Kong, it's actually, um, you know, a lot of things like such as going abroad to co compete, uh, it's, also, it's almost free for charge for us students as right. the Education Bureau, you know, sponsors some of it. And also you get a lot of trainings for free and um, you don't really need to have a lot of uh, money to begin with for these kinds of activities. So that's why you see a lot of students from different schools, not just, you know, um, you know, the top, top schools in Hong Kong right. joining these kinds of competitions. Yeah. 
thank you, Terry, for sharing. So I think I'm going to come back to ask you. You two being the a, a, a very good product, a very um, good students from the um, gifted education um, a program that we have in Hong Kong. So what suggestions will you give our committee? What can we do more that more students will benefit? Because Hong Kong, we need of talents. We're always searching for more talents and we want to enrich them and making sure that we have a gifted education for all. So what would you suggest to us? Um, I think we should extend the like aspects of gifted education to more aspects. For example, like we may focus more on STEM or sciences now, but then actually in other aspects like performance arts, visual arts, or even like uh, fashion design, there are a lot of like uh, good talent in Hong Kong, and a lot of students are actually very talented in these area. But they may not have the. Uh, is, this is not considered as a culture of excellence in Hong Kong, and it may not be the top career in Hong Kong. So that's why people may be like restricted from going into these. Korea, but I guess we should also utilize their talents there so and to provide more opportunities and exploring their interests and helping them to build up their own brands or build up their own interests in the future. So I guess we can have a more diverse communities in the future. All right, Terry, I'm going to, you're going to have the last question of the show. You know that Hong Kong finally has a youth blueprint that came out six, seven months ago as being in the, in the youth category. What do you consider is the biggest problem in Hong Kong right now and uh, how do you solve it? Well, I guess in terms of like youth kinds of problems, I guess it's the kind of, you know, the promotion of the encouragement of diversity among youth decisions in Hong Kong. Perhaps um, there's different kinds of, you know, outgoing paths for many of our youths today, but I guess society indeed in, you know, imposes some kind of restriction on what they can pursue. And sometimes they're only looked after when they have good results for many of our teenagers. So therefore, it would be a good idea to you say pursue more of their kinds of interests so that teenagers could even diversify their interests, which is particularly essential in today's digitalized world and perhaps a globalized community. Yeah. Right, thank you, Terry. And I'm afraid we have to end here. As we conclude our discussion, I want to express my appreciation to your guests this evening, Terry and Icy, as well as Banish and Manshing from last week for their invaluable insights and perspectives on the challenges within Hong Kong's education system. It is evident that there is a need for an education system that prepares students for the challenging demands of the modern world and nurtures their diverse talents and potential. Thank you for joining us and have a great evening.